Okay, we we will start the short session because at seven we have a, a big ceremony, so it's better that uh, we are ready for this ceremony, of course. So, welcome to this uh, to this session dedicated to two topics: the launch of uh, official launch of Nature uh, Africa, not the official launch, sorry, the collaboration to explain a little bit more the uh, Nature Africa uh, initiative. And we will start first by the recommendations. You, you cannot hear me? You must take it. Ah, OK. I can sing if you want, right? if it's better. At the end of the day, of course, uh, we need some animation and so on. But. And, um, and uh, sorry, no. And so in, in June, as it was the super year of biodiversity in 2020 and then 2021, the traditional European Development Days uh, that are every year in June were uh, on biodiversity and green economy. And so at that uh, occasion, uh, the, the Director General International Partnership have decided to nominate a high level panel of practitioners and of scientists to have uh, a few uh, recommendations, high-level recommendations for the Commission, the European Union, to the future programs on biodiversity. And so today I will show you the, the panel so you can see it, it's uh, the, the panel of all the experts. What is imp interesting is that we have really uh, a good gender balance. We have a lot of Africans, uh, only uh, a few uh, Europeans, and it was really intentional. And we have the chance to have one of the experts here, well-known Russ Metermeyer, and he will explain us the, uh, the eight streams of recommendation that were uh, done by this uh, high-level panel. So, uh, Russ, can you, you have more or less 10 minutes to explain uh, those, uh, those uh, eight, uh, eight uh, recommendations. Thank you. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Okay. I have the rather difficult uh, task of trying to condense into 10 minutes a whole bunch of documentation that uh, we, we produce, a really excellent, uh, excellent program of work. But um, I'll do my best and give you some very brief summaries of what, we, uh, what we've come up with. The first of the uh, priorities is the conservation of critical ecosystems, which really, as far as I'm concerned, is the most basic one and the most important one. And it includes, you can see them here, maybe you can read them, preserve uh, the main terrestrial and marine areas, forests and other ecosystems with high integrity, with a target of 30% of land and seas under effective conservation. But I want to emphasize here that it's not just a random 30%. It really has to be the right 30% and that we need to focus on those areas that have the highest concentrations of biodiversity. We as an organization, you know, promote the concept of hotspots and high biodiversity wilderness areas and also uh, the key biodiversity areas. And I just want to make a plug for an event we're having tomorrow morning at 930 over in the reverse, the red pavilion in which we're uh, launching a new book on these uh, key biodiversity areas. We want to explore all the governance models and uh, protection degrees, including management by local communities and indigenous peoples, which is very important. And we want to uh, integrate conservation and green economy sectors into large landscapes and seascapes. Now, the second is restoration of degraded landscapes, and the target is restore 300 million hectares of degraded ecosystems in Africa and other regions by uh, 2030, make restoration economically viable and a source of jobs and growth. And of course, restoration is very labor intensive and it really can generate many jobs. And include the restoration targets in the landscape approach to ensure synergies with sustainable agriculture and other sustainable uh, activities. But it's not just about tree planting. It's also about what we call now proforestation, enabling degraded landscapes to regenerate and also growing out from core protected areas through natural processes of regeneration that guarantee that uh, you're going to have all the biodiversity that exists in those natural areas still intact. Sustainable uh, food systems uh, support nature positive agricultural practices like agroecology, deforestation, few, uh, pre-value chains, 
Second, support sustainable food systems in partner countries by improving uh, policy coherence, harmful sub subsidies and trade, and promote uh, multi-objective landscape approaches of large territories. And I'd also like to add here that we need, really need to look at how we can have more of a shift to plant-based diets around the world because uh, cattle raising and, and other activities of that kind really are very damaging to the environment. The next one is legal sustainable use, uh, uh, sustainable safe wildlife use. As you all know, wildlife trade is really a major problem around the world. It's second only to the drug trade in terms of its, its overall value. So the whole idea is fight wildlife trafficking by addressing supply and demand from poacher to final user. Ensure that trade and consumption of wildlife is sustainable and benefits local communities and control the spillover of pandemics. We know that all too well. Really get rid of these wet markets, really have much more control on uh, major bushmeat trade and uh, related activities. This is really a critical issue because we certainly don't want to see another one of these pandemics emerging anytime soon. Um, knowledge gap, this is something where I think we're actually... Oh, next slide, okay. Knowledge gap, this is something where I think we're doing actually quite well, uh, introducing new technologies into our conservation activities, applied research on ex ecosystems and wildlife, their sustainable use, the interactions with uh, human health issues, reinforcing uh, local and national capacities to produce and utilize scientific information and decision making, and disseminating in information through integrated regional platforms for decision makers. As I say, I'm very pleased with the way this is going worldwide and we need to ramp it up even more. Indigenous peoples and local communities, this is absolutely a critical component. And if I look back uh, 40 years or so, and I, this is my 12th uh, IUCN Congress going back to 1981. And uh, indigenous people were hardly even considered way back then. And now they've become a major component of everything that we do. So we have to adopt a community-based rights approach um, in all conservation and development programs, including free and informed uh, consent, free prior and informed consent, and ensure that other effective area-based conservation measures fully recognize areas managed by IPLCs. And this is really key because the last time I looked, there were about 12% of the, it was about 12% of the land surface of the planet in indigenous and community owned areas. I think at least 20%, maybe as much as 25% is in the hands of indigenous peoples. And we really need to empower them more and more to manage these ecosystems because they're the best stewards. In most cases, they're the best stewards of uh, the land on which they live. MEAs and international governance, uh, this is obvious, support uh, EU partners to implement biodiversity relevant uh, multilateral environmental agreement, agreements and improve the coherence and visibility of biodiversity related policies and financing strategies at a national level. And the last one is sustainable green finance, promote green investments for biodiversity through policies and public grants, technical assistance and financial incentives and biodiversity offsets. And to re reflect the role of biodiversity and sustainable growth by integrating nature related risks and climate resilience in their policies and valuing and accounting for nature in uh, all the economic activities in which, uh, in which we're engaged. And there's some very exciting things going on. I don't know how many have heard of the animating the carbon cycle, uh, integrating conservation of large animals, for example, into, uh, into the whole issue of climate change. And this is something that's going to be talked about more and more in the future. And then I'd like to just finish up by emphasizing the importance of the um, overseas uh, territories um, and departments of Europe, the so-called dum tum, places like New Caledonia, uh, Mayotte and Réunion in the Western Indian Ocean, some of the Caribbean islands, French Guiana in uh, South America. These are critically important areas for biodiversity conservation. And I hope that, that Europe will pay much more attention to these in the future because they occupy a very, very key role in global conservation, not just for Europe, but for the entire world. So I think I'll end there.
Excellent, Russ, really. Thank you very much. And I would like, again, to thank you and to thank the, the entire panel, because indeed, we did, because I was a member of this panel, we did an incredible long uh, work because it was delayed by one year, of, of course. And, and now we have really the, the basis also for, for helping our counterparts in the, in the commission, also the delegations to, to really build uh, very uh, strong uh, programs. Now the second part of this uh, event is the, uh, the discussion around uh, Nature Africa. And for that, we will have two phases. First, we will explain. So my director, Carla Montesi, will explain the, the, the vision. She is in Brussels, but uh, she will now uh, take, the, take the floor. Then I will briefly explain more in detail what it will uh, represent uh, on the ground. And then we have a high-level panel uh, with uh, Christelle Pratt, the Deputy Secretary General of the Organization of the African, Caribbean, and Pacific States in, uh, in charge of climate change and environment. We have Tom Lalampa, the C CEO of the Northern Russian Trust in uh, Kenya. And we have uh, remotely Olivier, uh, Mr. Olivier Mouchouete, uh, who is the, the new um, um, head, uh, director general of the Institu Institut Congolais de Conservation de la Nature. And so we will have three reactions to uh, Nature Africa. But first, we have Carla. So she is my director, so of course I will give you the floor and uh, so Carla. Many, many thanks, Philippe, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Very happy to join you in Marseille, and apparently there is an incredible atmosphere from what I have seen. So many, many thanks, Philippe, and, uh, and the rest for the excellent introduction and allow me personally also to thank the incredible uh, work that Uh, COVID-19 pandemic has made clear that health planet and health people are interlinked. You know now, you are listening about that in the, since the last three days. We all seem to agree that we have to decouple economic growth from resources use. And we have to ensure a transition towards a greener, a fairer and a more sustainable world. Now, biodiversity is clear play a central role in this, in this vision. Uh, urgent action need to be taken and need to be taken now. I can say that if uh, 2015 was an important year for the multilateralism with uh, the Paris Agreement and with uh, the 2030 Agenda, this year and the next year with uh, the COP15, we have in front of us an incredible opportunity to be successful also for the biodiversity. You have already listened. The European Union is clearly committed to the biodiversity conservation around the world. It's a long-term commitment, and I have to say, it's not just words. Uh, you have already listened that we are committed to progressively raise our fund for biodiversity to 10% by 2026. And Ras has already mentioned that uh, uh, we have now 30% of the European Union budget that will be dedicated to climate action objective. And as you imagine, this objective will be ine inevitably also contribute to the achievement of the, our biodiversity objective. Now we are talking now about the initiative, the Natura Africa uh, initiative. We know that uh, Africa is uh, rich in biodiversity, but also that the forestation conflict Wildlife trade, pollution also contribute to biodiversity loss in the continent. So for us, preserving ecosystem in Africa is crucial. And it's crucial not only to ensure food security, but it's crucial also to ensure jobs, health and the climate resilience. And this is why the biodiversity priority is clearly priority in our partnership with the African continent. Together with our member states in a Team Europe approach, we seek clearly to support Africa, our African partners, in, forg in forging a sustainable future. With this uh, Natura Africa initiative that uh, we want to, to build with our partner countries, we want 
that we are sharing with you now, uh, this Natura Africa initiative clearly reflects our engagement and uh, the goal to have uh, the preservation of the ecosystem as a priority in our partnership. Um, this new initiative, I, I we say, is fully aligned with the IDD recommendation that you just heard about, and is also an important element in, in the lead of uh, the future African Union, European Union summit that we will have next year in 2022. What is this Natura Africa initiative? I will say just in one sentence, with Natura Africa, we want to bring people and the planet together for mutual benefits. So we are collaborating with African partners, governments, members of the private sector. We are collaborating with local communities to clearly identify key landscape for conservation and development. And with this <coughs> initiative, we really want to focus all the efforts on creating sustainable jobs for local community. At the same time, of course, addressing security, preserving the ecosystem, preserving wildlife, but clearly creating this link between jobs for local community and the preservation of the ecosystem. Because we really think that this is the magic solution to clearly preserve the ecosystem. And allow me to give just to you an example. Maybe it's an example that you know now very, very well. But I want to just mention our partnership in Virunga National Park. As you know, it's a world heritage site in the Eastern Democratic Republic of, of Congo. Virunga is not only home of the famous mountain gorillas, but it's also, as you know very well, it's the site of armed conflict. So for us, it's a very important region because there is a combination of important security aspects with our uh, biodiversity uh, issues. And uh, allow me to take this opportunity also to congratulate uh, Olivier Mouchette that is in the panel immediately as for its new nomination, its new responsibility. And uh, I wish you, I wish him all the, all the, all the best for its new responsibility and new task. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I will listen to you. Now, collaboration between park management, the European Union, the private donor, has really enabled the park not only to become a, a sanctuary of uh, the wildlife, but has also contributed to the economic development of the region. Intervening in this region allow us to provide 70% of the region gamma electricity because we have worked in the park, but we have also contributed to creating electricity around the park. We also estimate today, and the director will tell us, that the 10% of the job that was created in the Virunga National Park go to former members of Armed Group. So we succeed in some way to integrate the former Armed Group. I will not give to you all the detail, but allow me to say that we are really very, very proud to, to work with the Virunga Alliance as we are proud to partner with the Northern uh, Rangelands Trust in Kenya. And of course, we will hear much more now in the debate that, that will follow. Now, with, uh, once again, with the Natura Africa Initiative, we are currently working with the full range of stakeholders to beginning the implementation. And we hope to begin to be able to begin the implementation in 31 countries on the continent. Beginning the implementation with clear people-centered conservation and development programs. This session will allow you to discover in more detail. And now Philippe will also mention clearly follow-up step in this initiative. But clearly we hope to be able to present this initiative together with numerous other initiatives that the European Union is supporting as the Great Green Wall 
all, all the action that we are doing in the sustainable food system that has also a key component on the preservation of the nature. And we hope clear to be able to present whole this with our partner, African partner countries at the next European and African Union Summit uh, next year. I stop here and uh, I really look forward to listen to your debate and I will join you during the, 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 the conclusion. Many thanks, Philippe, and uh, all, the, all the team that you are there. Many thanks. Over to you, Philippe. Thank you, Carla. So, um, as we are a bit late on the program, I will be a bit fast uh, on, the, on the details, but we had already two technical sessions. So, what is it about, really, what we, we say, the landscape approach? So, here, uh, it's better to, to start from, uh, from an example. So, here we are in North Cameroon. The North Cameroon is the biggest uh, complex of protected areas in Central Africa, contiguous protected area. Faro, Benue, Bubajida National Parks, plus a lot of hunting uh, zones there that are managed, some by communities, some by private owners. The problem, is a problem sometimes, is that you have a lot of different pressure, a lot of different stakeholders, and the habitat is degraded, not only the habitat, the ecosystem and the services that provide to the population are degraded. You have the cotton front coming from the north and the south. You have a lot of agricultural encroachment in the protected areas. You have the transhumans also coming and sometimes they are not, uh, let's say, the, the classic pearl uh, that, uh, that we know, but the, the big, the big uh, earths uh, owned by uh, very rich people also, it must be uh, clear. And we have a lot of conflicts. So it means that if you manage, if you try to, to support only the protected areas, of course it will be a, a failure. You need to work at this landscape uh, level. And so this is the, the logic of the, the landscape approach. It's not what we did in the past, sometimes uh, just the buffer zone around uh, the protected areas, but that's really a, a, a different uh, scale. And now what we, we try to, to promote is really that we need technical activities in terms of conservation, capacity building, anti-poaching, ecological monitoring, research, management effectiveness monitoring. We need technical activities uh, on the development part, sustainable agriculture, range management, energy, infrastructure, education, uh, handicraft, and so on. But probably the most important part of this approach is the upper uh, layer, which is more the, the soft part, which is the governance between the different stakeholders. We have, in a territory, we have different uh, interests, different actors that have more or less influence, and we need to, to work with, of course, the actors will decide uh, the future of the landscape. It's not a program that will come. So those actors uh, they need uh, to, to work all together in an inclusive manner. So it means a strong place also for women, for youth, for indigenous people, because they must have a full seat at the table. They need, we need also sustainable finance for this landscape. And what is important, this last point, is really identifying who is really influential in the landscape and how we can uh, really manage those actors in order to make the landscape sustainable for uh, all the, 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 the partners. So this is the map where, with the delegations and the African partners, we have identified uh, the, the, the possible uh, landscape approach. Mon many of them, have, have, uh, some partners are already working on those landscapes. Look, clearly, the, you can see two different colors with the national programs and the, uh, the transboundary uh, uh, programs. Those programs, so you have uh, terrestrial programs and uh, coastal programs. We have a, a, a flyer that uh, we cannot distribute because it's paperless, but I can give you the, the, the address where you can download the document. I have a few spare copies uh, if you really need, but... Uh, but uh, and so, it is, uh, Roxana, you didn't uh, hear me, so it's fine. So this is the 50, uh, so what uh, Carla said, 30 countries out of the 42 countries of uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa have put biodiversity, forest, ecosystem monitoring at the center of, of, the, of the cooperation. Not the main part, but it is 
uh, written in the program, so it means that maybe 10% of the program will be on those issues. It's, it's, it's a revolution because in the previous phase, it was only four countries, and now we have 30 countries. So you can see the, the upscaling, really. And now, so this is inspired by a different document that we have produced in the past. So I make, again, the publicity for the, the newly, uh, the, the recently launched here, uh, Air Protégé d'Afrique Centrale. Uh, so Quentin is there, Florence and Charles are maybe there also, the authors and editors. So that's really a, a very nice uh, book. And we have this uh, new uh, leaflet that I can uh, provide you a few copies. How does it work in pract uh, practically? So the, in the driving seat, because many of you will ask, okay, but uh, it's a nice concept, how do we implement it? No, actually it will be implemented based on the, on the local context, of course. It is a, a general approach, but the context in a forest area or a savanna area with the mining companies or with the presence of logging companies, it, it will be completely different. So this concept, it's just the approach, it is now defined by the partners, the first, the partners, uh, the African partners, African government and delegations, the headquarters who are just there for supporting technically the delegations because they don't have all the capacities in all the countries. We don't have all the capacities, huh, but uh, some, sometimes a little bit more. And we have also some facilities that help us in this work on biodiversity, on forest, on agriculture, energy. So we have really a pool of experts, African, European, that can help uh, the different delegations. What uh, mentioned uh, Carla is that the Team Europe initiative is very essential. Uh, the example, Northern Cameroon, for example, the, there are many programs uh, supported by Germany, by France, uh, there on uh, rural development, on energy or protected area management. So, no, the approach is really to work much more together than we did in the past. So it means a mechanism of coordination between uh, those donors. But the most important uh, category is this one, the landscape stakeholders. And there we have, of course, the governments, the central, regional, or even local, uh, the local communities that is really central to this concept, uh, the private sector and the, uh, the uh, civil society organizations. So this is really, in a nutshell, what will be uh, Nature Africa. So it's difficult. Uh, I, I could speak hours and hours, but as it is my third presentation on Nature Africa, I have the tendency to repeat myself, and uh, it's not good. So no, I will. Uh, okay. So no, I will ask to uh, to uh, our panelists to react to uh, what uh, to what Carla and myself have said. So we. I'm, I'm just looking. So, uh, so Christelle, you are the you are the deputy secretary general of the organization of the African, Caribbean, Pacific countries, in charge of climate change and environment. So, you are not from the from from the region. You are originally from Fiji, but Africa is really also at the center of uh, of uh, ACP. And uh, clearly, there is an evolution in the in the way that we have conceived biodiversity uh, conservation and now with more development. So do you, do you agree, do you endorse this approach? Briefly or? Okay. Bon, uh, Tom, uh, no, please. <laughs> can you be a bit more specific? And, uh, <laughs> bon, I can tell you it, it was arranged huh, between us. <laughs> now he's going to try and behead me. <laughs> Thank you, Philippe. And, and we did think that so late in the, uh, late in the day, we should sort of bring some humor uh, into some of the events. Um, but I, I just want to recognize all of you uh, that are attending today and um, also uh, Director Montesi, uh, Carla. Um, it's good to see you online. It would have been nice to have seen you in Marseille, uh, but maybe we'll meet in Brussels. Um, but I'd like to thank, um, you know, thank you, Philippe, uh, for the kind invitation uh, to participate uh, and for the question. Um, and I'm really speaking on behalf of the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States uh, and our Secretary General, uh, His Excellency Georges Rebello Pinto Chicotti. And just to make a few sort of brief remarks uh, on, 
at this launch uh, of Nurture Africa, um, an ambitious EU uh, initiative um, to, you know, for biodiversity conservation in Africa, but that it really does build on previous effort uh, and experience. Um, and so um, we do extend our congratulations uh, to the European Union um, for its leadership in developing such an initiative. Um, it is both timely uh, and necessary for Africa's biodiversity and ecosystems, which are of, uh, and has already been mentioned, immense importance uh, to securing the lives, livelihoods, and well-being of a vast majority of Africa's peoples who depend on biodiversity. Uh, and as a worthy contribution as well to the urgent need for rethinking, resetting and reshaping how we must act if we are to solve the global crises that confront us all. It is apparent that we must change our approaches uh, to managing our land, water, forests, oceans and the biodiversity on and within and genuinely embrace and support integrated approaches that take account of multiple uses, multiple disciplines, and multiple stakes of both land and marine scapes. We must also acknowledge the limits of ecosystems and its biodiversity in supporting our lives and livelihoods. And we must listen carefully to those that have long lived experiences such as the peoples of the intervention areas that have been selected under Natura Africa. The OACPS welcomes the initiative being a people-centered approach to conservation and development, and especially its use of an holistic and integrated landscape approach and marinescape approach to ensure equitable and sustainable use of land and water resources whilst also strengthening measures to mitigate and adapt to climate change. We are particularly encouraged by the initiative's keen focus on empowering communities that rely on nature for their livelihoods and their well-being, because they are the most directly impacted by environmental degradation. Empowerment of the local people must therefore strengthen local communities to participate meaningfully in the conservation and management decisions because it is their place where they have lived and where they will continue to do so. We support the deliberate efforts that will be made to enhance the local community's capacity to genuinely participate in policy and decision-making processes, as well as mechanisms for communities to access funding under the initiative to implement locally-led initiatives that reinforce communities to sustainably manage and use their land and waters for their livelihoods and also for conservation. The vision for Nature Africa resonates well. It resonates well with the very recently adopted resolution on biodiversity by the OACPS Council of Ministers in early July, which underlined the importance of ecosystem protection and taking urgent actions to halt further biodiversity loss and the restoration of degraded ecosystems to sustain and safeguard the socio-economic development needs of present and future generations and to combat climate change. So um, we again congratulate the European Union for taking another bold step to expand the portfolio of investments towards biodiversity conservation and management. And as the OACPS, uh, we are honoured to be part of this launch. Uh, event of Natura Africa, and we stand ready to work with you within the framework of the soon to be signed new EU OACPS partnership agreement to support its every success in implementation. So I thank you. Thank you, Christelle. And I would like also to, to mention this strong 
uh, partnership that we have with uh, OECPS and the EU and uh, with uh, emblematic programs like Bioparma that you can see here. And uh, this yeah. is a stand where Bioparma is very present. Also the sustainable wildlife management that we had this, this afternoon. So uh, that's really a very strong partnership with really uh, uh, strong programs. Now I will uh, go to Olivier uh, Mouchouete, who is in Kinshasa, if I'm, if I'm uh, okay. Olivier, are you there? Olivier? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear Hello? you. Yes, we can. Nous, nous t'entendons, Olivier. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so, so, so thank I you have very a, much. Uh, I will try to speak uh, in English. Uh, uh, I have a question for you first. <laughs> so, Olivier, so you are recently... Yes, uh, of course. You were recently appointed uh, DG of uh, ICCN, and you know that we have a, a long partnership between uh, yeah. DRC and ICCN and uh, EU, and it was also applying the Nature Africa principles uh, in many countries, in many sites like Virunga, and you, you are back from Virunga or Yangambi. So, how do you see that? Uh, what are the lessons that you can learn from that? and? And how do you want that we change a little bit our collaboration on that? Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to, to thank you, all your team, for giving me the opportunity to, to share this moment with, with you internationally. It's very important. As you just say, it's only three weeks ago that I have been uh, appointed as, as the new CEO of uh, l'Institut Congolais de Conservation de, de la Nature. For me, of course, it's a, a very big honor, but in the same time, it's a, a very, very big challenge. Uh, last week, I spent uh, three days uh, in, the, in the very heart of, uh, of our Zirunga uh, uh, National Park, and I had the opportunity to... to to feel the pulse there. I think we lost you, Olivier. City con conservation. Uh, as, uh, as a public institution, uh, uh. Olivier, I'm afraid that the line, the connection is really, really bad. Olivier? Yeah. So m m maybe we will switch. Wait, to... Can you hear me? Yes, it's better. Go. Hello? Over to you. Over to you, Olivier. Uh. Hello? Oui. Can you hear me? Yes, vas-y. Okay. I, I will be very short because uh, as uh, I take the management of the uh, ICCN, I, I decide to, to manage the, the whole thing uh, according to three main axes uh, um, to refer this, this uh, 50 years old uh, public institution now here in Congo. First, we have to work on the, the human rights. It's very important at all level, with the population, with the, uh, uh, with the, the, the eco guards, with the, the military. We are working with, as you know, in uh, in Virunga. Actually, we have to we have to fight against uh, armed groups. It's it's very uh, uh, it's very violent the situation that we have here. So human rights is a key issue, and we we have to work on it. The, the second point, very important, is the, to respect the integrity of our territory. Uh, as you know, uh, the protected areas in, in Congo, that means 13.5% uh, of the whole territory. This is very huge. And uh, if you take in, in account the buffer zone, this is 25% of the whole territory. This is very huge. And as a public institution, we have to... Uh, to to make to make things clear that the, the the boundaries of our protected area have to be respected by everybody 
this is also very important. <laughs> the, the third very important point is to reach the auto financing of our organization. As you know, we have, we have I think, three main uh, issues on which we can work for this. Of course, it's the ecotourism. Today, with, with um, Ahmed groups and with COVID, it's quite difficult to make money with ecotourism, but uh, it's a, a very important issue for us. The, the second very important uh, income possibility is with energy. As you know, we have a, a huge potential for hydro energy with solar energy, and uh, I think this is a key issue to uh, organize the local communities around um, um, hydro power. Olivier? I think you we lost you again. Okay. Vous m'avez perdu? Oui. Nous avons nous vous avons perdu. Voilà. Vous pouvez y aller maintenant. Did you hear what I said about yes. the reference tree? Yes, it was energy. Uh, Human rights, okay. uh, respect so, of the territory and energy. Yes, I say ecotourism, energy, and agroforestry. The, the, the three main incomes that we are uh, aiming to, uh, to, to secure out of uh, auto financing of the whole system. And uh, with these points and with the new management that I will try to, to set up here, I'm sure that we are in very good harmony with the main principle of Natura Africa. I, I think it's a, a, a very good initiative. As you know, Philippe and Carla, you, you know, and uh, I'm thinking also about Philippe Sarako. Philippe Sarako yeah. is coming back here in Kinshasa. I think that the experience that has been, uh, that has been um, granted here in Congo during more than 30 years now, uh, contributed to organize this new system that uh, uh, European Union is implementing now. So we, I, I will do my best to uh, reorganize the whole system and so that will uh, enhance our, uh, our efficacy on, on the ground with the people for the biodiversity of the country. Voilà. Thank you so I much, Olivier. This is all what I want to say. As, as you know, I am new in the system, but I'm very pleased to be with you there in, uh, in Marseille. I'm sorry not to be with you, but uh, we have many things to do here on the ground. Okay. Thank you very much, Olivier. Really, I imagine that you have so, so many things to do uh, nowadays, and thank you for... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we can uh, really... Um, we are with you because uh, the, the task is really immense and, uh, and we know you won't sleep uh, a lot uh, during the, the next weeks. And uh, again, I would like also to, to say a word to, to my colleague, Filippo Saraco, who was also at the origin as uh, Nature Africa and now he's, he, he preferred to go back to the, to the field, to Kinshasa, mm -hmm. to implement the program. So he is a very very dedicated person I would like to exactly. to, to rendre hommage. Okay. Now we have we had the intra ICP level, yeah. now we have the national and then, then we come to the to the local one, which is actually where really things happen. And so we have Tom Lalampa. So the NRT it's a, it's a model that uh, he will explain us probably uh, briefly where the community conservancies uh, are already a bit applying a, a similar approach in Nature Africa. Can you can you tell us how NRT is, let's say, I don't say compliant, but it was a precursor of Nature Africa in uh, in some extent. You prefer you go there? Yeah. Um, well, let me start there. <laughs> well, thank you very much, um, uh, Philip. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, this EU initiative of uh, Nature Africa is quite exciting for a number of reasons. Um, first and foremost, it's because it's people-centered conservation and development. Number two, it appears as a conservation uh, of inclusion as opposed to exclusion. And I'm certain and confident that the concept, the model will be highly uh, received in Africa 
because this is what people cherish. People are keen on people-centered approaches. Um, and also thirdly, by the fact that you know, uh, development and conservation are quite intertwined, intertwined and inseparable. And so I, I think bringing those pillars together uh, really matters. I run the Northern Rangeland Trust, an umbrella a community uh, organization that uh, has a membership of about 43 community conservancies, bringing about uh, 6.3 million hectares of land, communal land, into a uh, proper conservation. And so it's quite exciting. And I'll just use the examples, and uh, in particular, why this model, the, the Nature Africa, I think, will contribute a lot to what we are doing, uh, both to global, regional, and, and national. I think uh, based on the Paris Agreement, the 3030, and I take the case of my country, Kenya, um, we got a, a, a target of 30 percent, uh, putting 30 percent of our land into uh, conservation. Currently, we got 20, 21 percent of our land mass under conservation, and out of that 21 percent, 8 percent, 8 percent of the 21 is uh, the national parks and reserves. 2 percent is forests. That brings to 10 percent. 11 percent, as it stands right now, is from the community conservancies, that where communities have also come on the forefront and brought 11% into the table. So currently we stand at 21%. We are short of 9%. And that 9% translates to 12.8 million acres. And so where, shall, where will we get the, the 9%? Just looking at land, not even sea or water. So the 9%, because the parks will hardly grow or expand, is likely just to come from the communities. As I mentioned, we currently have a membership of uh, uh, 43, but we have so many other communities on the pipeline waiting to join. We're so glad like, uh, that between last year and this year, the EU, the FD, and Denmark, and other EU member states enabled us to bring an additional 1.9 million acres of community land into conservation, which we haven't included into the 9%. So potentially, um, working through this initiative, I see that the community conservancy model, which is really growing in Kenya because the legislation in, can in the country is quite progressive, is likely to enable Kenya to attain our Paris uh, uh, agreements. When I look at uh, on the ground, because I am on the ground, um, working with the local communities and villages and women and youth, when I see our local communities through their conservancies um, um, uh, handling or managing uh, the health of the rangelands, you know, um, managing degradation, restoring rangelands, restoring forests, doing plant grazing, managing invasive plant species on their own, using their own hands and using their livestock and managing it well. I think uh, the Nature Africa model will only help to strengthen, to boost and to strengthen that initiative that's grassroots, that's trying to reverse degradation. The, health, the communities in northern Kenya are dependent on the health of the rangelands. Our life will see it so much tied to health to the environment because to be able to pay a medical bill to be able to set, to pay school fees for your child it entirely depends on the health of those uh, environments and those rangelands because most of them are livestock keepers so it's quite interesting when i see a community in uh, garissa county in samburu to the border of somalia it's called ishakbin it's a somali community they are conserving and protecting the only left less than 500 individuals globally of uh, Airola antelope. Globally, less than 500 individuals left. And they are protecting, they are conserving. That's really helping to, uh, to restore and recover the, the species that are disappearing from this planet. And those are communities. Those are not protected areas. Those are just communities. They know they have less than 500 individuals of that Airola antelope left globally. And it's on the hands of those communities. When I look at a community in Samburu, further towards Marsabet, that are supporting and conserving on their own land, a black rhino population that's now growing at 90% on their own land. And it's not a formal protected area. It's within the communal landscape. It, it, it contributes to the global species recovery. When I look at a community conservancy like Namnyak, that communities rescue often abandoned baby elephants and they take care of them, they rehabilitate, they feed on goat milk and rewild them. What an achievement. I think the Nature Africa will really boost those initiatives. Within the Northern Rangeland Trust that I run, um, conservation is about people. And we're using conservation as a, as a tool for development. 
And when I look at what's happening through uh, the support from EU and EU member states and other of our development partners, and I see as uh, uh, creating jobs, just over 1,400 permanent jobs have been created through this grassroots community initiative. I, I think in an area in particular in Africa where jobs are hardly to come by, I, I think it's a big thing, using conservation. And when I see our women, our youths getting into enterprises from beadworks and leather and uh, financial assets through their community conservancy model, and I see them concentrating with water conservation, I think it really uh, fits within the, um, within the Nature Africa initiative. And so it's quite exciting, you know, to see that through this conservancy initiative, we are talking about rights and governance, and these community conservancies are more focused around rights and governance, and also peace, because, you know, bringing communities, these conservancies are becoming a platform for these communities to talk. Vocational training for our youth or girls, it's just amazing and ensuring that women and youth get into the leadership. I reckon that uh, the Nature Africa um, is coming uh, initiative or model is coming at the right time. It's very exciting. And I assure you, Philip, that's going to be well received in Africa. And there's always a slogan we like saying that, please do not leave any community behind. You know, let's have communities with us. We can achieve more. We can hit all our targets if we need. And we need communities. The, the goodwill from the co local communities is really there. We just need to organize them. And uh, through credible community institutions in the model of community conservancies that are integrating their own livestock with wildlife conservation, they manage their forests. Within the landscape where we operate, we've got the fastest growing canopy forest in Kenya. Just managed by the local communities through a core management with the government. And it's just exciting. Uh, and so really, I think this is coming at a very opportune time. Um, and to the, and in the, the most interesting thing is about people-centered uh, conservation model. Um, I think conservation has always been viewed as exclusion of the local communities. But if this is going to be more of about inclusion, I, I think it's going to be um, uh, well received. And also we participate in the uh, European Union Development Days. Quite exciting. Uh, always to be joining those uh, virtual calls. And sometimes I invite other community members just to listen. And I think it's been very exciting. Uh, Philip, rest assured that this will be well received in Africa. And we look forward to the launch. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And you told me never give a, a microphone to a Samburu. He will never stop. And so it's clear now. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so I have a question for us, but it seems that we are really short of time. And uh, I have a look on Roxana. Uh, Roxana, where are you? Or, and uh, be, we have to go. We have to go. Con OK. I'm sorry for the questions. I'm available for the questions after the event. I'm really sorry, but uh, it's, uh, that's the rule of the game. And, so I will leave, uh, give the last word to my director, of course, because w when is my, the interview for the promotion, Carla? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Carla, you have the floor. <laughs> but <laughs> in, the, in the interesting end of the timing will be very, very short. But, uh, Philip, I'm quite sure that you will be there around to answer to all the the question that uh, we will be there. So let me just end this session saying many, many thanks, uh, Christelle Olivier, Tom Russ, for your interesting intervention. I can tell you that on the Tour Africa initiative, we really hope to be able to move on very, very soon with the official launch, as well with the implementation and the operationalization in the different uh, uh, 30 countries very, very soon. Together, I'm quite sure we can do something very, very different. And once again, many thanks for all of you for joining this session. And I hope really to be able to see you in presence very soon. Many, many thanks to overall for you. And I let you to the next step. Bye-bye. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, all of you, for the, your attendance. And now we have a celebration on the 
by Parma success and the best success. So it was related to your, your question on the OCTs and uh, overseas regions. We have also the success of the best program and the Bio Parma program. So uh, Roxana, no, you are the master of ceremony, I guess. Apologies again for the, the lack of time for, for the questions, but uh, we are available, all of us. Thank you so much and have a good night.